In Module 7, we move from one epidemic to another, from the opioid epidemic to the obesity epidemic. The U.S. has been battling an obesity epidemic for many years now. Obesity leads to type 2 diabetes and increases risk for a number of major health problems. A very important question is whether the legalization of cannabis may impact the obesity epidemic and the diseases related to obesity. If greater access to cannabis increases the risk for obesity and type 2 diabetes, the U.S. will be in deep trouble. On the other hand, if cannabis or some formulation of cannabinoids decreases risk, that would be a very welcome development. The traditional stereotypes surrounding the use of cannabis, uh, well, think about, for example, the munchies and images of young people pounding Cheetos and playing video games. Well, those stereotypes might lead one to hypothesize that greater access to cannabis might make the obesity epidemic worse. Surprisingly, it turns out that there are some published papers that address this topic, and ironically, these papers suggest the opposite. In some of these papers, cannabis use is actually associated with a lower risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes. However, more research is definitely needed, and the mechanisms that underlie that association need to be clarified. It is possible that the impact of cannabis products on risk of obesity may vary as a function of the type of product and the route of administration. For example, effects may vary as a function of THC versus CBD, or as a function of smoking versus edibles. Understanding the details will be very important for understanding how cannabis may or may not impact risk for obesity and type 2 diabetes. Regardless, it is clearly an important area of research and education, and the goal of this module is to educate students in this area. I hope you enjoy it. So in this first lecture, we're going to talk about um, the definition and epidemiology of obesity and type 2 diabetes, and we're going to start with the scope of the obesity problem in the U.S. As many of you know, there is uh, currently an obesity epidemic in the U.S. Now, obviously, we spent uh, the last module talking about the opioid epidemic, and uh, sadly, this is yet another epidemic, uh, although this one we've been dealing with for quite some time now. So more than two-thirds of U.S. adults are currently overweight or obese. As of 2017, every state in the U.S. had more than 20% of their adult population with obesity. However, this does vary quite a bit uh, in terms of geography. <clears throat> so I can, I'll show you the uh, map in a minute. But first, let's talk about how obesity versus being overweight What's the difference? How is it how is it determined? So the measure that uh, public health officials and, and scientists often use to assess uh, these uh, or make these determinations is body mass index or BMI. And the formula for BMI you see here is basically weight divided by height. <clears throat> if you're interested in in calculating your own BMI, there are a number of calculators online that you can use. But this uh, calculator here, this this uh, link. Yeah, is to the CDC website, which includes a BMI calculator. So the way it works in terms of the definitions is if your BMI is less than 18.5, it falls within the underweight range. If your BMI is 18.5 to 25, it's in the normal range. If it's 25 to 30, it's in the overweight range. If it's over 30, it falls into the obese range. So here's the geographic distribution of obesity across the United States. This is according to the CDC and was put out in 2017. And so what you see here basically is that the, the green, where there's green, the um, obesity is only t uh, 20 to 25% of the population. So basically, you know, Colorado and, uh, and D.C. And then where it's yellow, it's 25 to 30%, and light red, 30 to 35%, and dark red, uh, the prevalence of obesity is over 35%. <clears throat> I should mention Hawaii too is uh, is on the low end of the, of the uh, uh, obesity range here. So this is looking at trends over time in uh, what percent of uh, um, adults are overweight and obese. And so the blue line represents overweight or obese, and the um, uh, orange line represents obese. 
So basically the blue line is over a BMI of 25 and then the orange line is over a BMI of 30. And so the important point here is the um, change over time, right? So we're going back to uh, 18 – I'm sorry, 18 – 1976, 1980, so the late 70s all the way and through projected uh, 2030. And you can see increases then from um, the late 70s up until you know the late 90s, a slightly less of an increase then from the 90s through um, – 2000, say 14, and then the projection is to see um, even greater increases as we move um, through 2030. But this is pretty significant, right? We're going from 15 percent to uh, to 35 percent, so more than doubling um, in terms of uh, obesity. So it's an important thing. We'll talk more about why, why exactly that's important in a second. But what are the risk factors for being overweight or or obese? Well, there's a number of individual factors, so obviously your genetic makeup, <clears throat> family environment, family history, um, me- medications that are being used, education, race, ethnicity. These are all known individual risk factors. Also, the microbiome, and this basically refers to the um, bacteria in your gut. We're going to talk a lot more about the microbiome. I believe it's um, module 13. So there are also behavioral risk factors. So basically, you know, your your diet, what you're eating, whether you're engaging in exercise or not, um, whether you're sedentary, and then also there are environmental factors. So we know that the availability of food. Um, so either you know uh, the availability, significant availability of bad food, and low availability of good food. Obviously, those are factors that are important in terms of obesity. And then also, of course, um, building. Uh, people have been working on um, the effect of having an environment that's conducive or not to physical activity, as well as the role of food marketing promotion. So all these factors in your environment can play a role too in terms of uh, risk for obesity. Um, so it is multifactorial. You probably get a sense of that just from the last slide, but this is a nice sort of um, depiction of how that works. Um, comes from the paper referenced at the bottom of the screen there. But basically... There are biological factors, behavioral factors, and environmental factors um, that are important. And this is basically enumerating you know, some more of those uh, uh, in addition to the ones I talked about. Um, two quick points here. Um, sleep is an important factor I didn't mention before. And, of course, tobacco use uh, as well. Okay, so <clears throat> what are the consequences of obesity? Um, many of you know this probably, but there are a number of, of um, medical consequences, a number of biological consequences, everything from cardiovascular disease to diabetes, which we'll talk more about uh, in this module. Um, cancer is a big one, um, you know, gout, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, fatty liver disease. There's a number of things um, that uh, qu- quite a few actually uh, consequences of being obese. But the main thing that we're going to talk about in this module is the link between obesity and type 2 diabetes. And first, we need to, of course, talk about what exactly is diabetes. With diabetes, insulin, which is a hormone that's made in your pancreas, and it's basically its purpose is to get glucose from food into cells and to be used for energy. And so when it's absent or it doesn't function very well, glucose stays in the blood and doesn't get where it's supposed to go. And um, so diabetes occurs when that glucose is too high. Type 1 diabetes is basically when the immune system attacks and destroys the cells in the pancreas that make insulin. Um, And then the net result is uh, glucose remains in the blood. And um, type 1 diabetes is not related to to behavioral obesity. The one we're focused on is type type 2 diabetes. Here the body does not make or use insulin very well. It's not very efficient. Um, So glucose... Glucose remains in the blood. It is associated with behavior, right? So poor diet, lack of physical activity, and obesity, which is why we're focused on type 2 diabetes. And then there's also what we call prediabetes, basically uh, the precursor to to type 2 diabetes. Here, blood blood glucose levels are higher than normal, but not high enough to be diagnosed as diabetes. Obviously, it's a huge risk factor uh, for um, progression of type 2 diabetes. This is just a nice graphic that sort of gives you a sense of how that works in terms of uh, insulin resistance um, versus insulin sensitivity. So in a healthy state, your body's sensitive to insulin, and it doesn't take much to get the job done in terms of getting glucose where it's supposed to go. In an unhealthy state, your body's insensitive 
uh, to insulin. And there it takes a lot of insulin to accomplish what needs uh, to be accomplished in terms of glucose. Okay, so what are the consequences of uh, type 2 diabetes? Well, if it's not managed well, it leads to a whole host of medical problems. And so we talked about cardiovascular issues, heart disease and stroke, nerve damage, kidney disease, um, you know, problems with your extremities. Oftentimes, type 2 diabetes eventually leads to amputation. Uh, also, eye problems, eye disease, gum disease, sexual uh, uh, and urinary tract or blood, uh, sorry, bladder problems. Uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, sleep apnea, depression, linked to cancer, as well as dementia. So basically, it's a risk factor for all kinds of, of problems. This I already showed you the geographic distribution of obesity. This is just looking at the prevalence of diabetes. This um, figure, though, comes from 2013. And so here we're looking at, um, you know, uh, basically age-adjusted county-level prevalence of diagnosed diabetes among adults aged 20 years and higher. And the, um, not surprisingly, of course, it tracks the um, geographic distribution of obesity as well. So the lowest <clears throat> uh, levels are in the lighter shades, and the highest levels are in the darker shades of red. And again, you can see it tracks very, very much the ge um, geographic, geographic distribution of obesity. So what about the prevalence of, of, uh, of diabetes? According to the National Institute on Diabetes and, and Digestive and Kidney Disease, or NIDDK, over 30 million people in the U.S. have diabetes. Just over 84 million people in the U.S. have um, prediabetes. So again, 84 million prediabetic. That's that's huge in terms of the, um, you know, the number of people who are likely then to transition into type 2 diabetes. Um, so understanding the public health impact of behaviors that might either exacerbate or potentially mitigate or reduce type 2 diabetes, that should be a very important um, public health. Uh, priority, right? So we need to understand. You know, this isn't an, an this is it is this is an epidemic. This is important, and we should be very mindful of things that might impact this in a positive or negative direction. And obviously, one of those things might be the legalization of cannabis use, which we'll get to uh, eventually. Okay. So, what are the risk factors? Risk factor factors for type two diabetes. And um, so basically there are two that are modifiable um, that we sort of talked about already, which is being overweight or obese and physical inactivity. And then others are not so modifiable, right? So your age is a risk factor, uh, family history, obviously you can't change that. Um, also a history of other um, kind of related issues like high blood pressure, cholesterol levels, et cetera. And then uh, race and ethnicity can also be a uh, non-modifiable non risk factor. So in summary, obesity is an epidemic in the U.S., and increasingly, this is true for around the world, obesity is a direct uh, contributor to the increase in rates of type 2, type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a serious illness that, if it's not managed um, e you know, effectively, it has a number of negative consequences, very serious negative consequences. And although ob obesity and type 2 diabetes have a complex etiology. There are lots of different causes, lots of different risk factors. Both are strongly influenced by modifiable risk factors, including diet and physical activity. So diet and physical activity are absolutely uh, important in terms of altering uh, risk for type 2 diabetes. So in, just in terms of discussion, and this is sort of to, to prep you for what's coming next, um, in discussion or reflection, right, you should reflect on this question, which is, um, what are the different ways in which um, widespread access to cannabis might impact the obesity epidemic and type 2 diabetes? So if you were to think about the relationship between – or the possible relationship between uh, cannabis legalization and obesity and type 2, type 2 diabetes, what do you think that looks like? So in this module, we're going to talk about current treatment approaches uh, to type 2 diabetes and obesity. 
And so um, first, of course, it's important to understand that it is complex. As we've already talked about, there are many risk factors. Also, a number of symptoms that go along with type 2 diabetes that include things like increased thirst and urination, increased hunger, feeling tired, blurred vision, numbness or tingling in the extremities, that is the feet and hands, sores that don't heal, and uh, sometimes unexplained weight loss. The symptoms develop slowly over years. Um, Occasionally, some people don't have these symptoms. So for the most part, it is a um, uh, long-acting, you know, uh, takes place over a number of years in terms of the emergence of these symptoms and the development of type 2 diabetes. So how is it diagnosed? Well, um, there are one-time blood tests that you can take like a fasting uh, blood glucose test, also hemoglobin A1C. And basically higher values um, indicate uh, type 2 diabetes. There's also an an oral glucose tolerance test that's done after eight hours of fasting. Um, So basically a a baseline blood draw is taken and then you consume a glucose beverage and then another blood draw is taken at one hour and again at two hours after the glucose beverage. And if the glucose is still high at the two-hour time point, that suggests type 2 diabetes. So how about prevention, especially when it comes to um, uh, prediabetes? So as you know from the last lecture, prediabetes is a state of elevated blood glucose and A1C levels, but not so high that a person meets criteria for uh, diabetes. And so um, there has been some work done, some research done on prediabetes um, and how uh, one can intervene in terms of the progression. And this is known as the Diabetes Prevention Program. It was a randomized controlled trial of 3,234 individuals with prediabetes, and they were randomly assigned to one of three conditions, a placebo condition, a metformin condition, which you'll learn in a minute is basically a medication uh, that addresses um, uh, uh, diabetes, and then intensive lifestyle intervention. So these are the outcomes for the um, diabetes prevention program. So this is looking on the y-axis at accumulated uh, percentage of uh, or incidence of diabetes, and then um, this is basically time on the x-axis here. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002. But the bottom line is, in terms of the incidence of diabetes, you can see the people who receive placebo had the highest level of diabetes, and people who received metformin were in the middle. The people who basically received the intervention designed to modify lifestyle, those are the people who were doing best uh, after four years. This is also looking at longer-term outcomes beyond um, uh, four years, and you basically, you know, the as you go farther and farther out, the effects start to become um, less pronounced, at least in terms of the metformin versus lifestyle, but for predominantly for the most, uh, you know, for, for the most of the time, the outcome uh, continues to show that pattern where lifestyle changes are superior to metformin or placebo. So um, let's talk more about preventing diabetes and, and pre-diabetes from turning into diabetes. So just as with the overall prevention of diabetes, intensive changes in behavior particularly as they relate to weight loss, that is the best method for preventing diabetes. And what does that mean? It means establishing a healthy diet, increasing your physical activity, and decreasing your sedentary behavior. And you just see some, you know, again, healthy healthy foods, exercise, um, and trying to avoid sedentary behavior. Those are um, key for preventing prediabetes from transitioning to diabetes. So other um, treatments that are important, um, obviously we already talked about diet, um, physical activity, but also monitoring glucose is important. Um, you know, tracking the impact of these changes on blood glucose uh, obviously is a, is a good idea. And then we have not mentioned this, but um, tobacco smoking is also highly related and an important factor here. So if you're a tobacco smoker, obviously stopping uh, is uh, absolutely critical. So I mentioned metformin already, but there are two you know main ways to deal with type two diabetes. <clears throat> and um, and one is insulin, which can be given via injections or via pump, and the other is metformin, which you see over here, which is a medicine that lowers the amount of glucose that the liver makes 
and helps the body use insulin better. And so this was the drug that was used, I mentioned before, in the outcome uh, outcomes of the diabetes prevention program, and which did show uh, superiority to placebo in terms of preventing the transition to type 2 diabetes. So there's some challenges in terms of treatment, right? Effective behavioral and medical treatments, they do exist, but oftentimes it's complex and difficult. So, I mean, it's not easy monitoring your glucose, insulin dosing, diet, and physical activity. Um, lifestyle changes in general are not easy are not easy to make, although they are effective. The, the main thing that is an issue is adherence. So establishing a program and then adhering to it, that is absolutely critical. But ad- adherence, you know, basically maintaining that program consistently over time, not always easy. So let's talk more about adherence. So only about 50% of adults with type 2 diabetes achieve recommended targets for blood blood glucose levels, achieve um, blood pressure targets, and achieve cholesterol targets, right? So about half of the people uh, are able to do that. And so taken together, less than 20% of patients achieve all three of the what they call the ABCs of diabetes management, which is um, A1C targets, blood pressure targets, and cholesterol targets. Um, so why uh, you know, is the success of this in terms of adherence only at 20%? Well, a lot of it's driven by poor adherence to behavioral lifestyle changes. And we all know it's not easy, right, to maintain a diet, to maintain physical activity. It, um, you know, we've known it's, those things are good for you for decades, but getting people to actually do them consistently, that's the hard part. Okay, so what are some consequences of non-adherence so, you know, to, your, to your program is designed to change your trajectory? Some consequences, um, basically, um, there are a number of consequences, right? And you can see, again, we've talked about some of these things already, um, problems that can arise if you're not able to change that trajectory. And um, ultimately, it's increased risk for hospitalization and uh, an increased all-cause mortality, so one important piece that we haven't talked about, but this is going to relate back to the, the cannabis side of things, is what we call diabetic neuropathy. Diabetic neuropathy, basically, it's a type of nerve damage that results from injury to the nerves, and it's caused by high blood sugar. And it's the most, uh, the most common form of this in, in people with diabetes is peripheral neuropathy. And what that means is that um, basically it is pain, um, or other symptoms in the feet and legs first and then the hands and arms. So basically in your limbs, in your extremities. And so what what exactly do people feel? Well, they feel numbness, a reduced ability to to feel pain or temperature changes. And, and we'll talk about, you know, what we've already talked about pain, that that's very important. It plays a very important role. You, if you can't feel pain, bad things happen. Also tingling or burning sensations, sharp pains or cramps, increased sensitivity to um to touch and also muscle weakness and loss of reflexes, especially in the ankle, loss of balance and coordination and um, serious foot problems like ulcers, infections, bone and joint pain. So clearly this is not something you want. You do not want per, uh, peripheral neuropathy, but if you have uh, you know, type 2 diabetes, there's a good chance you're going to experience some of this. And so how do we treat um, this particular kind of neuropathy? Well, there's no known cure. We, you know, it can't be reversed. And um, so what are the goals of treatment? It's to slow the progression, to keep it from getting worse. It's to manage the complications. It's to restore some function. It's to relieve the pain. And so oftentimes neuropathic pain is treated with anti-seizure drugs, um, also antidepressants, specifically tricyclics. And... Um, the problem with all of these drugs, right, and, and this is not too dissimilar for what we learned in the pain module, is that they have other side effects that are highly undesirable. So with the anti-seizure drugs, things like drowsiness, dizziness, swelling, with the antidepressants and tricyclics, things like dry mouth, sweating, weight gain, which obviously is not what you want if you're trying to lose weight, um, so nausea, dizziness, etc. So the... the there are drugs out there, they're not particularly effective, and they carry with them a number of side effects. Okay, so let's talk about the public health cost of diabetes and the obesity epidemic. And um, the bottom line is it, 
this is a, has a huge impact in terms of the personal side of things because it decreases quality of life and decreases life expectancy. But there are also some pretty big economic burdens here to society. And this little infographic from the American Diabetes Association highlights some of those uh, socioeconomic costs. So um, more than 30 million Americans have diabetes. Healthcare costs for Americans with diabetes are about more than two times greater than those uh, without diabetes. And it means we, you know, basically there's a cost of around $327 billion per year associated with diabetes. And um, we look at this and think about where is this headed? Well, you can, you know, look at the number of people who have prediabetes, 84 million, right? And so obviously a significant portion of these will transition into, into type 2 diabetes. And um, so it is significant. And the bottom line is in terms of socioeconomic costs, this particular epidemic is huge. It's significant, and we need to we need to change that trajectory. So, just some more um, work here. This is looking at um, uh, just the twin epidemics: so obesity and diabetes. And um, because they go hand in hand, it's really important to understand situations of variables that may increase the problem or decrease the problem. So, again, we're highlighting how is this connected to the whole cannabis thing? Well, obviously, what we want to know, what we want to explore, is whether cannabis might make it worse. Um, we're talking here about more of the public health for public policy, legalization, increased access. Does that make it worse or maybe not, right? And we need to understand that question. So in summary, type 2 diabetes is a serious chronic illness. There are successful prevention approaches, um, and, and this is true for people with um, prediabetes in terms of um, trying to uh, intervene uh, with them not transitioning to, to type 2 diabetes. And th those basically include diet, physical activity, and medication in the form of metformin, as you saw, was also also superior to placebo. And so once diabetes is diagnosed, treatment is complex, and we really highlighted the, the notion that adherence is central, it's essential, right, but also very difficult. And that is the, the big um, difficulty is getting people to stick to those um, lifestyle changes and, and monitoring the, the various measures. Um, so ultimately, this is an epidemic, a public health epi epidemic, because the personal costs are so huge and also the socioeconomic costs to the country are so huge. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about now the uh, potential impact of cannabis on obesity and type 2 diabetes. So um, basically, we're going to look at this from a number of perspectives. Uh, so for example, cannabis use may influence obesity and thus influence the risk for diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, so in, in that scenario, it might make it worse, right? Yeah, maybe it could make the uh, decrease the risk or make it better. And what's interesting here is that the work that's been done, the research that's been done, uh, suggests that it's um, not quite that simple, and um, uh, it's kind of a quandary actually. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then also, there's another angle here that cannabis or cannabis products might actually be useful for treating a major complication of type two diabetes. This is 
um, we're talking about here, we're talking about diabetic peripheral neuropathy, which we um, talked about what that was in the last lecture. And then finally, there's a third place or way in which cannabis use might intersect with type 2 diabetes, and that is it might also have an impact on an adherence to type 2 diabetes treatment. So those are the three sort of possibilities that we're going to talk about in this lecture. So <clears throat> what do we know about cannabis and obesity? Well, cannabis has been observed to increase appetite, and this goes way back in terms of the, the history of cannabis use. There's a Lancet publication in 1889 where a, uh, Birch reports that cannabis was valuable in the treatment of opium addiction and that it, quote, restored the ability to appreciate food. Um, so after THC was characterized um, back in the 70s, there was a number of studies showing that THC was associated with increased consumption of food. So there was a review paper. You can look at this from, from 1973. Um, basically reviewing experimental studies that showed that THC preferentially increased consumption of sweet foods. So <clears throat> here's a specific example, a follow-up experiment done by Fulton, Fishman, and Byrne uh, back in 1988 where they put six uh, male subjects in a laboratory for 13 days and they were given social time and private time and were also randomly assigned to smoke either two active marijuana cigarettes that were 2.3% THC potency or two placebo marijuana cigarettes each day. Their total daily caloric intake increased by 40% for the THC group. The increase was due mostly to increased consumption of snack foods, specifically sweets like candy bars, as opposed to more savory items like potato chips. So how does this work? What are some possible mechanisms? This is a nice graphic, the source of which is presented at the bottom of the screen here. But basically, when you consume cannabis, um, THC binds to CB1 receptors, as you know, and that can also increase ghrelin, which is a hormone that basically is linked to, uh, to eating behavior. So um, this uh, little depiction here shows you the THC impacting CB1 receptors, which in turn impacts ghrelin, which can increase appetite. And um, we also know, this is very interesting actually, there are uh, several medications that were um, studied maybe 10 uh, years ago, 15 years ago, uh, show that CB1 blockage, so blocking CB1 receptors actually decreases appetite, right? So again, CB1 is important um, for appetite. So there's this interesting paradox, right? So there are these older studies just suggesting that cannabis users have higher average caloric intake levels than non-users. And sometimes that can be, uh, somewhere in some papers, reported to be as high as 600 calories per day. However, um, if you look at the epidemiological evidence, cannabis use has been sort of inconsistently associated with, um, sorry, consistently associated with lower BMI, lower prevalence of obesity, lower rates of type 2 diabetes, lower levels of fasting insulin, lower insulin resistance, and a smaller waist circumference. So um, what's interesting here is that even though the you know there's one camp, um, one area of research and sort of the common stereotype that cannabis users uh, consume more calories and potentially more junk food, we also have a number of epidemiological studies suggesting that cannabis users actually show the opposite in terms of obesity and type 2 diabetes measures. In any case, and, you know, what this may suggest is that cannabinoids might do other things that are important too in terms of insulin sensitivity and diabetes. So um, just to drill down a little more here, there are two recent large epidemiological studies um, suggesting that this effect we just talked about is reliable. So this one came out in 2018, another in 2015. And um, again, suggesting this um, counterintuitive relationship between cannabis use and uh, diabetes. <clears throat> so how do we explain this paradox? Well, most of the research is focused on THC, right, which, as I point out in the first couple of slides, um, increases consumption of calories, possibly via CB1 receptors. However, we also have CBD or cannabidiol, which appears to antagonize um, CB1 receptors 
And um, research suggests that THC and CBD may have different effects on metabolic processes. And the point we're making here is that THC may do one thing, CBD may do something else uh, altogether. So as, you know, whereas THC acutely increases caloric intake, administration of CBD in animal models results in reduced feeding behavior. So when a cannabis extract containing CBD was administered to obese rats, it also resulted in, in weight reduction. And CBD has been shown to reduce uh, risk of diabetes in diabetic mice, right? So, so one possible story here is that maybe there's another uh, factor at work. Maybe it's the you know one thing that's important here in terms of risk for obesity and diabetes has to do with inflammation. And so it's possible that cannabinoids. Well, we know cannabinoids have an impact, um, positive impact on inflammation. And um, both THC and CBD exert inhibitory effects on inflammatory cytokines, although these actions um, seem to follow different pathways. And so the, the point here is that uh, this is sort of a hypothetical or theoretical uh, link between or explanation for or mechanism for how um, THC and cannabinoids may actually um, may actually be a positive thing for um, for uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes. And so um, the point here is that studying both THC and CBD in different amounts and ratios, it may be in laboratory studies to understand their impact on inflammatory markers related to obesity and, and type, 2 di- type 2 diabetes. That obviously is, I think, an important area of work. And so what is this association between, say, inflammation and and obesity and type 2 diabetes. Well, we know that pro-inflammatory shifts are strongly associated with the development of insulin resistance. And so if, you know, cannabis has some anti-inflammatory effects, that could be uh, really important in terms of um, uh, lower insulin resistance and lower risk for type 2 diabetes in cannabis users. And so that's an area of research that I think that needs to be done. So again, this is maybe a, a, a a way to frame this without a bunch of words, but we want to understand, for example, how cannabis may impact risk or whether there's any therapeutic benefits. Um, and of course, this is the same slide you saw before, just showing why this is such an important problem. Um, you know, more than um, doubling or tripling uh, incidents, um, you know, from uh, the late 70s to um, projected into 2030. So, very important problem. We need to understand it. Now, let's talk for a minute about the uh, case of peripheral neuropathy. So when cannabis is helpful, whether it's helpful or harmful to obesity and and diabetes, um, the the thing is people are already using it to treat one of the complications of type 2 diabetes, which is peripheral neuropathy. And then, so here's an interesting study, the data for which is shown down here by Wallace and colleagues um, published in 2015, looking at differences between placebo, cannabis, low THC cannabis, medium THC cannabis, high THC cannabis in, in, at that time was 7% uh, THC in 16 patients with treatment refractory pain. So we're talking here about the um, you know, peripheral neuropathy in, in diabetics. And you can see here, this is basically pain scores on the y-axis and time since inhalation on the x-axis and then the different groups here. But if you look you know, roughly within the first hour after inhalation, what you see is that pain scores drop the most for individuals with the uh, who are getting the higher, uh, the seven percent THC, and then the um, low and medium group is somewhere in the middle, and then um, the placebo group uh, has the highest pain scores. And um, so, <clears throat> bottom line is, you know, and this is um, same kind of thing, but smoothed out. It does seem like there's a dose response relationship between reductions in pain and uh, and cannabis. So, however, not all studies have shown a positive effect. One study looked at uh, Sativex uh, compared to placebo in a double-blind trial. Both groups showed improvement in pain. There were no differences between the groups, between placebo and Sativex. Three points worth noting here. Um, in that study, depression was a major confound. Uh, more depressed patients experienced um, better outcomes regardless of condition. And patients continued using whatever medication they were already taking. So they, if they're already taking a, a neuropathy pain medication, they kept using it and took side effects in addition to that. So, and then finally, placebo effects were very strong, suggesting something um, 
going on there with respect to the diabetic neuropathic pain. So some potential um, you know, issues there in terms of the study. But again, mix, some mixed results. Okay, so you know, for people who are considering cannabis, they're, they're thinking about how does this compare in terms of side effects to other treatments. And so, um, so the, as the Wallace study showed, cannabis was effective even for patients whose pain was uh, not responsive to other common treatments. And um, the most common side effects noted by Wallace were euphoria and somnolence, right? And so when we talk about other treatments, more traditional treatments for neuropathic pain, like anti-seizure medications and antidepressants, we're talking about side effects like you know nausea, dizziness, decreasing appetite and constipation. There's a whole slew of negative, of negative side effects. And... Um, so the point here is that, you know, that's uh, an important consideration when you're thinking about, you know, cannabis versus something else. Not only is one more effective than the other, um, all, but also what are the side effects? And even if they're equally effective, so in other words, cannabis doesn't need to be more effective than something else, but if it has um, fewer risks and fewer undesirable side effects, that might tip the balance in favor of, of cannabis. And so obviously we need a lot more research here because only a couple studies looking at uh, diabetic uh, peripheral neuropathy and then one of them I mentioned actually was negative with respect to side effects. So more work to be done there. Finally, this last intersection we, I want to talk about was the possible effects of cannabis use on, on adherence, right? So adherence is a big problem. If you don't stick to the plan with type 2 diabetes, um, things are not going to get better. And as I already mentioned, a substantial portion of people are unable to um, adhere to the, um, the diets and the lifestyle changes that lead to um, the targets that they, they need to hit for their blood glucose and blood pressure, cholesterol, et cetera. So in thinking about people with chronic conditions like diabetes who might um, be using cannabis, I think it's very important to think about what impact will that cannabis use have on adherence to a medical uh, protocol, right? So, for example, if it obviously if it has a negative impact on adherence, that would be a, a net negative um, for the person, right? So um, there hasn't been a lot of work on this. But there's been a little bit. So the influence of cannabis use on, on adherence seems to depend on the medical or psychiatric condition being treated. So there's some work looking at HIV uh, medication adherence and no effect, finding no effect of cannabis use on HIV medication adherence, although cannabis dependence or cannabis use disorder was related to lower adherence. Also, people have looked at cannabis and um, adherence to antipsychotic medications for people with psychosis, and there were some um, negative effects noted in terms of the impact of cannabis on, on adherence to antipsychotics. So to date, um, there um, do not seem to be studies testing disease management or treatment adherence in people with type 2, type 2 diabetes who use cannabis compared to those who do not, although um, for other disease states there has been a little bit of work on that. So in summary, cannabis seems to cause an acute increase in appetite, particularly for sweet snacks, and um, those studies are going back to the you know, 70s and 80s. Paradoxically, though, cannabis use has been related to lower BMI, better insulin function, and lower rates of type 2 diabetes in epidemiological studies, and um, there seems to be um, some consistency there. So the mechanisms are not well understood. Um, obviously, this is an important sort of paradox to, to, to understand. It could be related to the fact that cannabinoids have anti-inflammatory properties, um, you know, either THC or CBD or the combination, and which in turn then may have a positive impact on uh, type 2 diabetes. And then finally, two other quick points. Type um, cannabis is uh, being used, you know, by some people to treat their peripheral neuropathic pain. The evidence, though, about whether that actually works or not is mixed. Obviously, we need more studies to be done. And um, one important point, though, of course, is always thinking about the side effects or risks of, uh, you know, cannabis versus the uh, more commonly used anti-seizure slash antidepressant tricyclic medications. And finally, it's not entirely clear either yet whether cannabis impacts disease management, um, adherence, right, for people with type 2 diabetes. And um, it does seem to have some negative impact in other conditions, 
but um, we don't know yet. Uh, but this is an area that really needs to be looked at more broadly, and it's not just for type two diabetes and uh, you know HIV uh, um, treatments, but also for things like cancer treatment. Right? If if um, if using cannabis is having a negative impact on adherence, this is very important to understand.